mini chocolate. No, you could stop me. Hello humans, my name is Dale Kingsmill. Did I hit record? I did, it's okay. This is a D&D video. I have mentioned, probably countless times, my belief in the power of shorthand. Today I thought I might actually explain what I mean by that. So let's jump right into it. Let's talk about genre. So first up I just want to explain briefly uh, the concept of generic expectations. Generic as in genre. genre ick generic of the genre. So I've talked before in um, in one video or another, I'm sure I'll find it and throw the card up. I've talked about fuzzy sets. Genres don't have clear boundaries, but what they do have are sort of a nebulous collection of um, tropes and things that we expect. Tropes that let a work fit comfortably within that genre. Oh geez, oh no the sun. It's gonna be one of those fun lighting days, clearly. So you have different expectations for an action film than you do for a rom-com, right? Even if both happen to, to have similar elements, so you might reasonably expect uh, an example from each genre to end with the lead couple uh, having a happy union. You know, both Notting Hill and Speed end with the couple getting together. But despite that, you still read those texts differently. That's how someone in a rom-com can mention that they're retiring soon and it just means that they're going to be retiring soon but when someone in an action film says they're going to be retiring soon, they're dead. You know they're going to die. These expectations are how you can start watching a movie and by the third scene you know who the lead character is going to end up with. An example of this, just the other day I was watching with my family and uh, you know it opens up, you've got your lead character and there are two possible love interests. You've got the guy that she has a crush on, and then you've got her longtime funny guy best friend. And you just look at that setup and you know that the best friend is Endgame. We all spend so much time steeped in generic storytelling that we've developed this subconscious language around genre. And, and it gets really nuanced as well. It trickles down through so many layers. You know how to read a horror movie, yes, but on top of that, in addition to that, you know how to read a zombie movie differently from a ghost movie, differently from a slasher flick. They all carry with them certain generic expectations of horror as a genre, but they also carry more specific expectations tied to their subgenre. Our senses are really really honed to this and it's been that way forever. So um, take Romeo and Juliet by Shakespeare. That play for, for a lot of it follows uh, a perfectly standard Shakespearean comic structure but we know that a Shakespearean comedy ends in a marriage. So an Elizabethan audience even watching this play for the very first time they, they would know that something is up the very second that Romeo and Juliet get married in the second act. It's too soon. It's actually, it's just like the, the sitcom best friend I mentioned. As we were watching the sitcom, we knew the best friend was Endgame, but uh, as the series went on, we started to not like the best friend, and we were all like, oh, I can't believe she's gonna end up with him, even before they got together, until it started looking like they would get together in the first season. And we all said, oh, well, it's fine now, because if they get together by the end of the first season, then they have their endgame card revoked because it's too soon. You know, if, if Romeo had um, happened to be banished before he and Juliet could tie the knot, you'd look at the structure up to that point and you would maybe think that there would be some, some wackiness, maybe some uh, disguises involved as Romeo tries to get back to Juliet uh, and they all have to try and resolve the problems so that he can get unbanished and the two of them can get married and that would be the happily ever after. But because Romeo is banished after he and Juliet get married, the audience can sense, they can sense after all that it is not a comedy, that it's all downhill towards tragedy from here. That and, uh, and a dude comes out at the start of the play to literally tell the audience that everyone's gonna die, but um, you know, apart from that, my point still stands. There are things common to each genre that we accept, and more importantly for this discussion that we're having, that we expect. Now, with relation to tabletop RPGs, um, D&D and similar games like Pathfinder, these are typically written with a mind for um, medievalist fantasy. They're thinking of the high fantasy genre when they're publishing it. And I do have to say high fantasy because fantasy is a genre, yes, but it has split up into its own distinct subgenres, each its own type of fantasy with its own generic expectations, just like the, the horror subgenres that I mentioned before. This stuff applies to 
a lot of games in other genres as well. You've got your sci-fi games, your horror games, your urban apocalyptic survival games. Uh, they're all following generic expectations as well. But for this video, we're specifically talking about D&D. So D&D carries with it and also runs using the generic expectations of high fantasy. You can see this in some aspects like, um, like the adventuring party. It makes sense within a fantasy setting because in high fantasy you see a medium large group of heroes, uh, main characters, and you go, wow, uh, maybe one or two of these characters will give their life along the way. Maybe they'll die in service of the journey. You see a similarly medium to large group of main characters within a horror genre setting, and you think to yourself that maybe one or two of them will survive. So even if the rules themselves, the bits that make the game a game, the, the rolling of dice and the, the maths, all of that stuff, those things aren't necessarily tied down to a genre, but we do still subconsciously load in our understanding of high fantasy to the game, mostly because of the language that, that, that we're wrapping it all up in. The set of rules is named dungeons and dragons. That comes with an expectation of high fantasy. We say as a player that our individual method of rolling dice and doing maths is called a paladin or a wizard, and those terms carry with them an expectation of high fantasy. We put on the covers pictures of giants and armor-wearing heroes with swords. So while the game at its bare bones doesn't really have a narrative genre, it also inherently does. And we can't really extricate the game from the expectations of that genre. We can we can absolutely fight against genre if we if we really want to. But personally, I think it's much simpler and much more effective if we use genre to our advantage instead. Because because here's what it is: um, when you decide to fight against the genre of your book or movie or game setting, you can end up with these clashes when something in that world doesn't line up with the expectations that your players or, or your audience have formed. Tolkien describes the effect. Um, he says that a story, or in this case a game, creates a secondary world which your mind can enter. Inside it, what the author, the DM, relates is true. It accords with the laws of that world. You therefore believe it while you are there, as it were, inside. The moment disbelief arises, the spell is broken. The magic or art has failed. You are then out in the primary world again, looking at the little abortive secondary world from the outside. And we don't want that. So you're playing with that constant willing suspension of disbelief and the player is suspended using the generic horizons of expectation. If you put something in front of your players that is too far outside of the realm of expectation for that genre, then you run the risk of pulling them out of the game, uh, maybe even frustrating them. Engaging with genre on the other side of things can become this really powerful tool. You can use it to inform your game arcs and create really solid narrative cohesion. You can use the shorthand of generic understanding to create information shortcuts. It gives you the power and the freedom to not explain everything, to let your players work it out. I mean, take my witches video, for example. By using staple tropes of the witch story subgenre, I can trust my players to pick up on it, to understand it and most importantly to play along with it. They'll be able to assume very quickly that there's probably a coven of multiple witches, that there's a ritual they're trying to complete, that the townspeople will become paranoid, all because you're starting from an opener that is common to the witch story subgenre. Like children are being taken and an innocent is being blamed. And the players come with an inbuilt genre savvy to know what happens in stories about witches. They'll likely take the next steps in that story even, because that narrative coherency is enjoyable in itself. But this does not mean that every story you tell within a genre has to be a homogenous lump of plagiarism, just the same folktale standard over and over again. Because while deviating from the generic standards can run the risk of, of clashing with player expectations and pulling them out of the narrative, deviations from the standard are also something from which we derive pleasure. Hans Jaus, who's a medieval scholar, argues that early modern audiences um, derived enjoyment from the ever-changing form 
of familiar stories. Here, the pleasure is provided by the perception of difference, of an ever different variation on a basic pattern. Yao suggests that for the medieval consumer of these tales, pleasure was gained from generic expectations being met by the storyteller, and this pleasure was then accentuated by deviations from the expected. He refers to this as the charm of an already ongoing game with known rules and still unknown surprises. It's like fan fiction. We all, I did, I literally did a, a lecture, a uni lecture on this uh, recently, talking about how fan fiction mimics this, this oral storytelling tradition that we've all carried with us. You know the story, you understand, you know, oh, there was only one bed. You know what's gonna happen in the story, but you again and again read different fan fictions with that same base plotline because each of them is different and you derive enjoyment from those differences from that base layer that you already expect and understand. That same sitcom again, it's, it's really doing a lot of heavy lifting for me in this genre video. There was a bit towards the end where a supporting character had broken up with their boyfriend and, and he, he showed up at the boyfriend's door to ask, ask for forgiveness and ask for him back. And the boyfriend was standing there at the door and was way off to one side of the frame and was holding the door right here. And we were all watching this going, Oh no, oh no, the boyfriend's already moved on, there's someone in the apartment because otherwise why would the door be there? They're gonna open it and there's gonna be someone behind it because that is part of the generic expectations of this, this genre. But it deviated, the boyfriend opened the door and there was no one there and invited the supporting character in. And we all cheered because we were really pleased. So you play the game of generic expectations so that you can then undercut it with the thrill of the unexpected. It's the same as poetry. Poems become interesting when you understand the, the rules, the structural rules of poetry, because then you can see where the poet has broken those rules. If the poet just writes a bunch of randomly and jammed stuff, then it's less pleasurable in some ways because there wasn't a recognition recognizable structure to begin with. I'm not naming names here, but I am thinking them very loudly. Yeah, take that. Svetan Todorov agrees and suggests that each entry into a genre, because of its differences, shifts the horizons of expectations a little bit. It permanently, just, just slightly, changes our understanding of that genre. He phrases it as, every example alters the species. Tolkien agrees uh, that the pleasure is in the different details of each story. Vladimir Prop who talks about Russian folktale also agrees, again, that just because of a, a an underpinning commonality, it doesn't mean the stories have to be the same. <laughs> These are like formal structuralists, and still they all say, genre families might share a lot of DNA, but that doesn't mean that they all look alike. Okay, so I've, I've told you not to go against genre, and then I've kind of told you that you should go against genre, and that's probably confusing. Basically what I'm saying is you can ignore genre entirely if you want to. If you are the kind of world building GM who derives so much pleasure from creating your intricate reality for the game. You know, it's a, it's a world where um, they put east on the top of the compass and it has uh, two equators and it's all islands like in One Piece and uh, the, the magnetic poles are flipped, you know, all those nitty gritty details. Do that, do what makes you happy, do what makes you enjoy the game, but do understand when you do that, that you'll be missing out on the power that the shorthand holds. You will have to get a lot of engagement and a lot of investment from your players to have them really register and understand that information. But if you use generic expectations to your advantage, you can let your players fill in the blanks and you can choose to fight your battles where they are most important to you. Geography is actually a weirdly great example. So I've, I've mentioned before that when I was, uh, you know, establishing my game setting, I was talking to some of my players about possible character backstories and I noticed an assumption that the further north you go the colder it gets. Keep in mind we're Australian, we're in the southern hemisphere so actually the further north we get the minute we hit Queensland it's just Queensland is a sauna. But this happens because European geography is within the horizon of expectations for high fantasy. It's an assumption that comes with the genre of a game called Dungeons and Dragons. For me 
that wasn't worth pushing against. So yeah, in my game, North is cold. And best of all, if I don't fight genre there, then I save up just a little bit of currency that I can spend on subverting generic expectations later on down the line when it does matter to me. It's important to note that you can also shift some of these player expectations by shifting the genre or the subgenre of your game. If you say at the top of your campaign pitch document that the game will be low fantasy, suddenly little things like the geography mimicking Europe are less likely to clash with your player's preconceived concept of what the game will be. Take Dragon Age for example, uh, Thetis is absolutely a fantasy setting, but rather than establishing themselves as a medievalist high fantasy, Thetis is more like, I guess, like a, a renaissance gr gritty low fantasy. So when you run into things like you learn that the south is cold and the north is hot, you're not worried about it because your expectation set has already shifted to not worry about that. So, you know, during character creation, just explicitly telling your players that the game will be low fantasy or urban fantasy or apocalyptic fantasy, whatever it is, the player's expectations are going to shift to match and their inherent understanding of genre is going to do all of the heavy lifting for you. Finally, something that I think is really worthwhile talking about is the idea of dipping into compatible genres just for a session or two within a longer campaign. So for example, uh, multiple times that I've been prepping for a session of D&D, we've got this overarching genre of fantasy and sometimes I will um, start to prep a session and I'll be doing it within the, the fantasy genre and it just won't feel Right, like something will feel off, it'll be um, a bit more of a slog to get things prepped, I won't quite be able to, to work out what order events will happen in, things like that. But almost every time, I want to say every single time, I can't think of a time that this hasn't happened, I realize that I'm working within the wrong genre. I stop and I step back and I look at the events that I know I want to happen and I go, oh wait, this episode isn't fantasy, this episode is a fugitive action flick. This episode is horror, it's a ghost movie. I swapped to movies instead of games. You apply this different genre, this this added, you, you, you genre mix for these sessions and the whole thing starts to come together. And your players are very likely to pick up on that shift. They will pick up on these new genre cues that you're using just for this session or couple of sessions. And once again, their expectations will shift to match and they will play along because that's where they derive their enjoyment. And these session breaks that go into a different genre, they end up being one of those deviations from the expectations of the fantasy genre that you're playing within. So it, it accentuates that pleasure, like, like Hans Jaus was saying. Do keep in mind, however, when you're doing these genre shifts, um, that some genres are going to mesh better with the, the preconceived expectations of fantasy within D&D than other genres. Shifting over to horror for a session might not be too hard, while shifting over to something like crime noir is gonna be a little bit more difficult. It's not gonna fit as easily, primarily because crime noir, you're expecting the lone, grizzled, uh, you know, the, the detective who doesn't have any friends, you know, whereas this is a party of heroes. So you have to think about how you're going to, look at this, ah, I am an angel. I am the moon. I am a glowing light upon all. Crime Noir has this, this loner archetype to it that is pretty core to the generic expectations. And you have six players and two of them are uh, there to be funny and crack jokes. And that doesn't mean you can't use that genre. It means that you're gonna have to think about how you can use it. Maybe you don't go Crime Noir, maybe you go buddy cop and you split the party up into different smaller groups. Things like that, thinking about how it might work. And each genre will have, you know, it's it's easily measurable points and it's not so easily measurable points. If you think about the, the ever-present uh, wish for a D&D heist, I'm looking at you, the chain of Acheron. Some elements of the heist cross over really easily. A, a big group of people with different skills all working to steal a thing. That meshes really easily. But heist texts often do this thing where you don't understand how the heist worked until after it's already done. They sort of reveal the plan after the fact. That does not mesh well, so you really have to work out how to translate it. It's just a matter of translating between genres and mediums. But with a little bit of, a little, a little bit of elbow grease, you can get it done. Ponder the subgenres, ponder the elements, see what tropes work, see how you can avoid the ones that don't. So there you go, the, this was quite a vague and evocative uh, episode. I do genuinely think it's really worth thinking about genre and, and our 
innate understanding, uh, our, our genre savvy that we come to the table with and how you can use that to your advantage, whether to speed things along, use it as a slipstream so that your players get things really quickly or whether you deviate from those generic expectations to surprise your players, to, to pull a twist. So that's that. Think about genre next time you're prepping for D&D or any other game. Apart from that, what is there? Oh, uh, on my uncle's YouTube channel, my uncle Graham has a YouTube channel, and I know that he's got a background with programming. I had this silly idea for a computer game and I asked him a question about coding and, uh, and it evolved into him sort of saying, hey, why don't I try to teach you how to code? And as we go through the process, we can film it and we can put it up on my channel so that people in the future who want to learn these things can, can have a video they can go to. And that's what we're doing. This is just very simple, long form, back and forth discussion. So if you happen to be someone who is interested in uh, in computer coding and seeing me struggle to, to grasp these concepts, uh, you can head on over to my Uncle Graham's channel and you can see the videos that we're doing there. All right, I do believe that's it. I'm done. Email this to your grandma. I will see you some other time. Mwah. Mwah. It's weird, but I'm sticking with it.